Yes, so today we're going to start looking at vectors in space. So, as Jubal says, 3D vectors, right? Um, and some of the things that we're going to be doing um, are going to have very natural sort of consequences from two-dimensional space, and they're going to seem like, well, obviously, that's how you would do it. In fact, most of the things we do will. All right, so for starters, just a little bit of preemptive kind of things, uh, we will extend our ideas from R2 to R3. And um, our points, just as you would expect, are labeled X, Y, and Z. Um, so to start with, um, we're just going to look at how to plot things um, we won't do very many of these. They're, they're not especially pretty to plot, um, but we'll have a couple of them in your homework. Um, but we're going to plot three-dimensional, so we're going to plot the point. And the plot, or the point we're going to plot is 3, 1, negative 5. So a bit of uh, background, if you haven't done any three-dimensional plotting, or maybe just haven't in a while, um, we're going to have Our z-axis is the top axis, that's z, and it comes out at angles, looks something like that. So this one's z, and this one's x, and this one's y. Um, we only draw the positive axes, um, and I'll show you why. Um, I'm going to draw in dotted form what the negative axes would locate, where they would be located. So this would be our negative x-axis, right, extending back this way. Our negative y-axis would extend back like this, and our negative z-axis would extend down here. And the graph gets really messy really quick when we have so many of those things plotted. So we generally just see, come on, there we go, the positive axis plotted. Um, as we are taking a look at plotting 3, 1, negative 5. So to plot the x value of 3, we'll make hash marks 3 out from there. And then we need to go the direction 1 in the direction of y. Um, but we need to do it in such a way that it is parallel to the x-axis that we just did. So it's almost like you've, you've moved out 1 from the location you were. So we were right here, and we're going to move 1 out this way. We're not going to try and um, you know, do anything different than make this sort of look like it's creating a, a parallelogram. All right. So when we move 1 out from there, we would end up going from here to here. And then from there, our z value is supposed to be negative 5. So we're going to count down 5 from there. And if you imagine taking, um, again, about the same measurement, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we would end up right here. Now, it's really hard to get a very good three-dimensional sort of image of where we are because we're drawing it in two space, right? So one of the ways it gives us the dimension that we would like to see is by drawing in um, sort of a three-dimensional box in that shaded, in that, that sort of area. So it would look something like this, and I will apologize in advance that I am not a very good artist. So I started to draw this before, so we will sketch it in. Actually, let me do it in that same blue color, like this. Okay, not perfect, but something like that. And then we would go down from here. And then if you can imagine coming down in the directions as well from here, we end up with this kind of a shape. You can see our box. So it's not perfect. In fact, that last line was a little bit even less than perfect from what I'd like. Whoops. So you have something like that. And our point that we attempted to plot and so forth was down here in the corner. This is our ordered triple, three, one, negative five. And that gives it some depth. Right, drawing that box kind of gives it some depth to have a feel for where we are. So this is three, one, negative five. And like I said, we're not gonna draw a whole bunch of them, but you're gonna draw a couple of them for me. Okay, so several things that we did back in two space um, in like algebra back in the day, um, somewhere that you probably did in middle school maybe even or, or early high school, um, are some of the components of things we're going to do, but we're gonna be doing in three space now. So the next one we're actually gonna take a look at is distance. So we're going to find the distance 
between the points. And the ordered triples that we have are 2, 1, 2, and 5, 5, 5. I'm sorry, 5, 5, 2. Get the number right. All right, so in two space, what's the distance formula? Yep. This is our distance formula in, in two dimensions. And all we have to do to extend it to three dimensions is add the z component underneath there as well, right? Yeah. Z2 minus Z1 squared. So I, I know you know how to, to like look at these and subtract. I might require that actually physically shown out in my intermediate. I, mean, I, wouldn't, I would definitely require it for my intermediate algebra students that are working with this right now. But if you can eyeball it and just give me the pieces that are squared, that would be sufficient. So, right, our, just, our difference between our x values and our, make sure I have those numbers written down right from what I had before. Yeah. The difference between our x values is 3. So this is 3 squared. The difference between our y values is 4. So plus 4 squared. And the difference between our z values actually on this one is 0. So we have this. 3 squared plus 4 squared is 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. So we simplify. Um, you would simplify with radicals just like you always would. Nothing different at all, okay? So exactly as expected. Um, another thing that we take a look at is we're going to consider a triangle. So we're going to do like a whole ton of examples today. Like everything is going to be an example form. There's all kinds of formulas in your book. I don't find them to be very valuable because they're intuitively what you would expect them to be based on the prior knowledge you have. So we're just going to do this from example form, but if you want to go back to look at anything specifically from a formula perspective, your book has plenty of those options for you. All right, so here's the next one with triangles. We're going to consider the triangle. with the following vertices. And then we're going to find the lengths of the sides and classify the triangle and the specific specific classifications that we're going to consider here um, are classify it as right, the right triangle, isosceles, which of course it could be both of those things, right? A right isosceles triangle, and then neither, if it doesn't fit into either of those categories. So how do we find lengths? The distance that we did before, right? Same thing. So here are my order triples um, for our vertices. This is example three. Um, we have, whoops, uh, negative one, zero, negative two. We have negative one, five, two. And we have negative three, negative <laughs> one, one. And in order to kind of help us keep things straight, I'm going to give those vertices letter names so that we can um, identify them as we go. And I'll just go in order. So this is A, B, and C. So our first one will be A, B. And um, notationally, the way we find length is it looks like a segment notation or a line notation. It just doesn't have a top. So A, B means the distance from A to B. That's notationally the way that that works. So distance from A to B, so if I look at the ordered pairs for the x's, I've got 0 squared. The difference in the y's is 5 squared, and the difference in the z's is 2 squared. Sorry, I'm already squaring it. Two. No, it was right. I was at yeah, 4. 4 squared. There we go. Negative 2 and positive 2, so 4 squared. Are those components okay? All right, so if you multiply that out, add it together, what do you get? 
Yeah, square root of 41. Okay, so that's AB. Um, we're going to move on to BC. I'll just do it next to it. Whoops, no hat. All right, so the coordinates for B and C um, looks like the X values differ by 2. And again, I don't care about signs because I'm squaring things, so it doesn't matter if I go left to right or right to left in terms of my, my letters, my, my, very, or, uh, my points. Uh, 5 and negative 1 would be 6 apart, so that's 6 squared. And then 2 and 1 would be 1 apart, so that's 1 squared. What's that one give you? Yeah, so what do we know right now? It's isosceles at the very least, right? It even could be equilateral. We don't know. It's not one of the things we're testing for, but it's at the very least isosceles. We need a third side. What is our third side going to be able to help us decide? If it's right, how is it going to do that for us? What would have to be true if this were a right triangle? Okay, so what property are you using to make that decision? I'm using the 45 degree. Okay, so you're, but where does that come from? Can you think of that? If you have a right triangle with two even sides using the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean. There you go. Yeah, it's coming from the Pythagorean theorem, right? So even if we hadn't have had the square root of 41's matching right there, we're looking for something to satisfy the Pythagorean theorem, correct? Yeah. Good. Okay, so A and C. Let's see. So A and C... Uh, the A values, or the X values, excuse me, differ by 2. The Y values differ by 1. And the Z values by 3. So what does this give me? A 14. So I already said this is isosceles. Just at a glance, we should know it's definitely not right with those three values. Why? Yeah. Right triangle, the you got it. In a right triangle, the hypotenuse, in fact, right, the, the, the whole, in fact, in any triangle, the biggest angle it has the has opposite it the biggest side. So this is the smallest angle. It is definitely not opposite the 90 degree angle if there were one. So it's not a right triangle. So this one is isosceles only. Okay, so. When you learn about distance formula in an algebra class, there's always another formula that accompanies it. Do you remember it? Midpoint. We teach them at the same time. The formulas have some similarities. I think that's probably the most like why. Um, and there's a nice connection, right? The fact that the midpoint would be half of the distance and so forth. Yeah, so midpoint would be our next place that we're going to take a look. So did I have space? Oh, I did. We'll do it here. So to do midpoint, we're going to do the midpoint of two particular points. So we're going to find the midpoint. Of the line segment. Joining. And our points are. 3, 4, 6, and 1, 8, 0. All right, so you know what the midpoint formula looks like in two dimensions. What do you do? You're very close. Plus. Plus, yeah. So midpoints are averages. That's what they really are. It's just like if you were trying to average your grade in the class uh, and you just looked at your exam grades or something like that, right? You'd take our two exam grades, you'd add them together, divide by two. That's what we're doing for midpoint, and we do it for the x and the y, and then also now for the z. So we're going to add together our two x values, so 3 and 1. Our two y values, 4 and 8. And then our two z values, 6 and 0. All right, so 3 plus 1 is four. divided by 2 is lovely. Uh, 4 plus 8 divided by 2, six. 6. And then a 6 plus 0 divided by 2, three. 3. So we have our midpoint. Okay. 
All good? Yeah, so I told you you're going to like this section, right? Just going to warn you right now, the list of homework problems is really long, but that's because they take very little time, right? This is not sequence, this is a series all over again. It's not. Yeah, kind of like that. It takes very little time. Okay. Um, all right, so we've mentioned two different formulas that are really the same formula already. We've mentioned the distance formula, and we've mentioned the Pythagorean theorem. And whether you've thought about them from that perspective or not, they are the same formula. A third formula that's exactly like those two formulas is the equation of a circle. So again, if you haven't thought about those formulas before, if you think about taking the distance formula, whoops, it was right here, and if you squared both sides, you would have the x values subtracted and squared, the y values subtracted and squared, the z values subtracted and squared, and it would be the radius on the other side that would be squared. And that's the equation of a circle. Now, without the z's anyway, it was the equation of a circle. Now it's going to be the equation of a sphere. We're in three dimensions, you bet. So we're going to actually find the equation of a sphere. And we're going to do a few of these, um, at least a couple, because the first one we're going to do um, is set up a little bit more directly, and the next one requires a little bit more work. So we're going to find the equation of the sphere. And the first one that we're going to do, very much a given, is an r equals to 2. And then the center, it gives you as 3, 1, 4. So our formula would say x minus 3 squared. And then what? Yep. And, and what will it equal? 4. Okay, so when it's given in this form, there's, there's little to no work to do. You're just evaluating or substituting the values in um, for the respective locations. Uh, the next one requires a bit more work. Um, so oftentimes, um, we're not given those pieces of information. We're given an equation, and then we're asked to put it into its standard form. And this one looks like that. We're going to write the equation in standard form. And we're going to also find the center and radius, which are pretty straightforward once we have it in standard form. So we have x squared minus 2x plus y squared plus z squared minus 4z equals 0. Now, except for the z components, this is not altogether unfamiliar to us because in chapter 10, we did some problems like these, didn't we? Um, for ellipses and hyperbolas specifically, um, and they work the same way. How do we find all the pieces we want in this problem? We yeah, we complete the square. So we're going to have the x squared minus 2x. What do I have to add to that to complete that component of the square? a 1, and if I add it to the right and left, I have to add it to the right. Uh, the y squared is kind of nice because there's no other y components, so he just gets to you know, be rewritten. Um, how about the z squared? What do I need to add to that piece to get mm -hmm, the square complete? I need to add a 4, and I'll add that again to the other side. Of course, the whole point in doing completing the square is that things factor as perfect square trinomials. So this is x minus 1 squared. This is y, or if you prefer, you can think of it as y minus 0 squared. You don't have to write that, but it, it's fine if you do. And then I have z, what? Minus 2 squared. And all of this will equal 5. So this is the standard form. What's the center? 1, 0, 2, and I haven't done a lot with negatives and positives here, but keep in mind that this formula does use all the signs that are opposite, right? The formula itself has some negative signs in the middle of them, so the opposite signs are showing up. And then what is my radius? 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so what in the world was it that we did in 11.1? Vectors. Vectors 2D. in 2D. So now we're going to do vectors in three dimensions. Okay, so this is our shift now. So this is all stuff that's just uh, plotting points and things like that, um, finding you know values within three dimensions. Now we're going to look at vectors in three dimensions. But again, all the things you expect to be true based on what we did last class period are going to be true again. All right, so it's just going to extend it by a dimension. So we're going to start with these directions. We're going to find the vector and its magnitude. So we have an initial point, a 3, 2, 0. And we have a terminal point. Of four, one, six. I feel like all my examples I must have chosen positive numbers just to try and simplify what we were doing because you guys can deal with positives and negatives just fine. Yes. All right, vectors. How do I find the vector V for this? Do you remember what we were doing in the last section? Right, you subtract the initial from the terminal. So we take our terminal x value, which was 4, we subtract the 3, and we get a 1. And if you want to write an IJK format, by all means, go ahead and do that. I'm going to write it with, um, uh, with the brackets like this. And I'm blanking on what I want to call them today. All right, the y coordinate, what would I get? Or the j coordinate? J direction, negative 1. And the k direction? 6. Okay, so there's our vector. How do we find magnitude? Yeah, it's the distance formula. Yeah, I mean, basically, we're a Pythagorean theorem, whatever version of it you want to think about. We're taking the square root of each one of those pieces squared. So I have 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 6 squared. And again, notice I just am ignoring negatives because I'm squaring things. It doesn't matter. What do I get when I square, or square each of those components and add them together? Square root of 38. And if we have the ability to simplify square root of 38, we would. We don't on that, so we would leave it as square root of 38. And you did it in three dimensions without even having to think about what you should do because it works exactly the same way, right? Just like what we did last time. All right, so we're going to use this same um, point um, or vector, really, that we did above, and we're going to do another extension with it. So using... V above, we're going to find a few things. So the first thing we're going to find is 2V. And then we're going to find negative V. And then we're going to find two, sorry, three halves V. Okay, so you know how to do scalar multiples of vectors. It works the same way in three dimensions. Take a look at getting those and then turn them to a neighbor next to you. How about you just turn back to front since you guys are all sitting in pairs today. And just make sure that you have the same components. We'll make sure everybody has the same thing and then we'll move to the next one. Okay, compare notes. Just make sure nobody has any arithmetic errors. Beautiful. Okay, what do you have for A? 2 negative 212. 2 negative 212, fabulous. B? Negative 1, 1, And C? 3 has negative 3 has negative. Okay, all good? 
Yeah, just like you did before. Okay. Um, so another one, we're going to look at one in IJK format now. So, and we're going to look at some vector addition, subtraction, things like that. So we're going to be given vector u, which is i. Okay, I don't think I can keep writing all of my hats and things today. Can I just stop now? Is that all right with you guys? And you all recognize that, like, I'll put them on at the end, just in the work in between. Okay, good. All right, so I have i minus 4j minus 2k. Um, let's see, v is i minus 3j uh, plus 4k. And w is 2i plus j minus k. And we're going to find the following. Z. And Z is going to be U minus 2V plus 3W. Okay, so we're adding, subtracting scalar multiples of vectors together. And I'm going to write each of the pieces down. And if you don't want to use IJK format and you want to use the bracket format, this, you can totally switch to that. That's not a problem. Um, so the vector u will be just done as is. So this is i minus 4j minus 2k. Um, then I need 2 times vector v. So vector v was i minus 3j plus 4k. And I need plus 3 times vector, uh, what was I calling it, w, vector w. So it's 2i plus j minus k. We're going to do some quick distribution and combining like terms. Um, they're going to feel like terms anyway. Components is what they really are. So I have i minus 4j minus 2k minus 2i plus 6j minus 8k plus 6i plus 3j minus 3k. All right, so i's. How many i's do I have? Five. There are five eyes. How about J's? Five, five again. Mm -hmm. And K's? Negative 13. Yep. Negative 13 K. So this is Z. And these are our IJK components of our composed vector. All right, we're going to find the magnitude of that then. So mag find the magnitude of Z above. What will we do? All right, square root of 5 squared, 5 squared, and 13 squared, right? What is that? 219. Um, the number's big enough, you might pause at least just to make sure it doesn't, you know, just be able to factor. Uh, it does divide by 3, but very quickly you see that you don't get it divisible by a duplicating factor to simplify. So it, it really is just the square root of 219. All right, so with this in mind, we're going to do a couple more things with these same vectors. I'm just going to slide them up so we have them as our reference point. We're going to find a, a unit vector uh, actually, let me do well. We're going to find a unit vector a in the direction of z. and then b in the opposite direction. OK, 
Okay, unit vectors. How did we do that last time? Yeah, we divide each component by the magnitude. And each of our components, namely the 5, 5, and the 13, they clearly don't reduce with the square root of 219. And I don't want the radical left in the denominator when I'm done anyway. So if you're able to do it all in one fail swoop, you're certainly welcome to do so. And you can rationalize as you go. So this would be 5 square root 219 over 219. And another 5 square root 219 over 219, and then I have 13 square root 219 over 219. Thank you, negatives, yes. What do you think you might do if we want the direction to be in the opposite direction of Z? Negative. We'll change all our signs, you bet. So everything that was positive is now negative, so that's the first uh, the I and the J components. And then the K component would be then positive this time. And of course, if these had the ability to reduce, you know, like the 5 and the 13 or the 5 and with the, uh, the 5 or the 13 with the 219, we would reduce them, um, clean them up as we go. Okay. Are you ready to look at something that's truly different? Because all this just feels like we just, same song, second verse, right? I mean, like, really, it's just the same stuff as before. Okay, so the next part's a little bit different than, than what we have seen. Um, so we're going to take a look at what are called parallel vectors. Now, we did not have parallel vectors in two dimensions. Um, if you'll remember, the reason that we did not have parallel vectors is because every vector that would have been considered sort of parallel in the way we think of parallel lines would have actually been considered the same vector because all we concerned ourselves with was direction and magnitude, right? So if direction and magnitude are our only concerns, then we can reset everything to the origin or to any particular point anywhere, and there's no such thing as parallel vectors. But in three dimensions, there is such a thing as parallel vectors. So let's take a look at what those would look like. So parallel vectors, two, non-zero vectors u and v are parallel when there is a scalar multiple or a scalar it is c We'll do scalar C such that U is equal to C times V. And that starts to look like something I just saw for those of you who are in linear algebra just a minute ago. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, this is not relegated to three space. We could have done this in two space as well, but the applications are in three space, which is why we didn't do it before. So we're going to determine if we have parallel vectors. So we have determine which vectors are parallel to Z. And I'll need to move Z onto our screen. Um, oh, no, I'm giving you a new Z. I take it back. I forgot. Okay, so Z here um, given to us is 3, 2, and negative 5. And we're going to write down a list of potential candidates for being parallel vectors. So I have negative 6, negative 4, negative 10, or sorry, 10, 2, 4 thirds, negative 10 thirds, 6, 4, 10, and 1, negative 4, 2. Okay, so what am I looking for to decide if these are parallel vectors? 
I'm looking for a C value so that the condition in the previous definition would be satisfied. So take a look at A. Is there such a C value that will work? Annika says yes. Yep, that's it. So this one, these are parallel, and the reason they are par parallel is because we have C equal to negative 2 that makes this relationship hold. How about B? Yes? Okay, so it's not quite as pretty of a C value, maybe, but it still works, right? Two-thirds will allow this to happen. How about C? Okay, we should be able to answer no really quickly, and you guys did for C. Why can you know at just a glance that it's not going to work? Yeah, the signs don't work, right? I need the first two signs to match and the, second, the third sign to be different. And this one has all matching signs. So this one's a no. And by the same token, D also doesn't work because the first two signs don't match. The last one's not different from that. So yeah, those are not going to be parallel to, to Z. All right, we can actually use this idea of parallel vectors to also talk about collinear points. So our next definition that we're going to look at is what we mean by collinear. And, and you know what collinear points are. What are collinear points? What should it mean? What does it mean in two dimensions? You've seen it before. They're on the same line. And usually when we're talking about this in two dimensions, we're talking about taking at least three points because every two points are collinear automatically. So you almost have to be talking about three points for it to even have any sort of meaning to it at all, right? So collinear points, well, I should say three or more, are points which lie on the same line. And this can be determined by finding if the points form parallel vectors. So we're going to use vectors to determine whether the points are collinear. And here are our points. So we have 4, negative 2, 7. Negative 2, 0, 3, and 7, negative 3, 9. So in two dimensions, this same kind of question, um, given, you know, three points, you can almost graph it and kind of get a, some kind of sense of, yep, they probably are, and then I can show it, or there's no way these three points are collinear. But in three dimensions, visually speaking, that's a lot more challenging to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to form these parallel or form these vectors and compare them. So I'm going to take uh, the uh, points and give them names like I did before to help us have a reference point. So we'll do them in order, A, B, and C. And let's find vector A, B. So what is vector A, B going to be? Close. Yeah, it's a positive 2 
and then negative 4. And then uh, let's do AC. What do you get if you do AC? All right. Are these vectors parallel? Yes. Why? Because they have a, com they have a scalar of one half. Or, or two, two depend negative two, depending on your perspective, yes. So um, let me write it that way. These are parallel. With C equal to, I'll use your negative one-half since that's the one you referenced, but you could also equally say C equals negative two depending on which perspective you're looking at it. So the points are collinear. Okay, I have one last example, and it's a very interesting one. Again, one of those things that doesn't require a lot of work in two dimensions to make sense, but in three dimensions, we have to be a little bit more careful. Um, we're going to take a look at um, forming a parallelogram, okay? So, oh, it looks like I still didn't get it off my last time I did it. There we go. Could have just left it up there and talked through it, couldn't I? That's what happens. But then we don't have to write. Then you would have to write and I wouldn't. Use vectors to show, so they're telling you that you're going to be able to do this, right? They're not asking you if it is a parallelogram, they're telling you it will be. But we're gonna use vectors to show that the points form a parallelogram. Okay, so what is the definition of a parallelogram? Four-sided. Mm -hmm. Parallel opposite sides. So I need to have opposite sides that are parallel, two pairs of them, right? And they have to have four sides in general, yeah. So our ordered pairs, or excuse me, ordered triples that we are given are two, nine, a one. We'll call that A. Three, 11, four. That'll be B. Zero, 10, two and that's C, and then 1, 12, 5 is D. All right, so here's the deal. Um, in two dimensions, if you were to put the points on the plane, and you had it something like this, uh, and I'll just label them like this, A, B, C, and D, you would know that we're going to attempt to connect A to B, B to C, C to D, and D back to A, right? Because you can see it, right? You, you would never attempt to do this to it, right? Like that, you wouldn't do that, right? That doesn't make any sense. But, oh, and then back to here. I don't think I quite got my thing right. That's what I wanted to do. You wouldn't do that. But that's just because you can see it. And you don't necessarily know that that's going to happen when we are working in three dimensions. So as we're taking a look at this, we're going to be able to avoid this, but we have to be careful not to jump to the conclusion that something isn't going to work right away. So if we take um, our points, we'll do them in, we'll just do them in order, A, B, and then B, C, C, D, and then D back to A. So we're just gonna do them in order as though this is the order we wish to have. Um, and so if I form A, B, um, I'm going to have 1, 2, and 3. It's all good. And if I form B, C, I will have negative 3, negative 1, and negative 2. So those aren't parallel, correct? So we're going to keep going, sure. Yep, CD. CD is 1, 2, 
and three. One other comment I didn't think to make, but it's actually true as well, parallelograms, office, the opposite sides are also equal, right? So it makes sense that I'm getting the same vector, exactly the same, so C equal one, yeah? So these two are parallel. Uh, DA, DA is one, negative three, and negative four. And if you compare that back to BC, you might be discouraged because it is definitely not the same thing, right? But the reason it's not the same thing is because the picture to the side is just what happened. We used the wrong pair. So we used A, B, and C, D, which those are correct, but we used B, C. What could we use instead of B, C that I haven't found yet? B, D, right? I could use B, D. Right? We knew that we wouldn't cross differently if we were doing this in two dimensions, right? But what actually happened here is that we found out that this actually needs to be the D and this one needs to be C. And if I did it in that order, I'm going to find that I'm, oh, I don't know why that's still on, but there it is. I'm going to be able to do it from that perspective. So if I do B and D, I get negative 2, 1, 1. And then what's the missing one that I haven't done? AC, yep. So AC would be what? Yeah, it's negative two, one, one. So it's these two that are parallel. parallel. Thus, we do have a parallelogram. Um, it's probably important to note that I can't really state the order of them, um, I don't know, I've zoomed, parallelogram, did I get it spelled right? I think so. I can state it, I mean, I can tell you what it is based on the work that I've done here, but we put the A, B, C, D in all the points. Those didn't exist prior to it. So reporting back that the A, B, C, D is the wrong order and it should be you know, something else, A, B, D, C, which is actually what it should be the based on the way that we just did it is fine, except that it's not really, I did have an extra L here, huh? Um, except that it's not really contingent upon the way the problem was started. Okay, homework. I don't think I changed the page number, so whatever the page number is, you guys can find it. It's seven something. It's probably 767, um, but seven something. Forgot to change that. Um, it's going to look long, but you're all going to be like, yeah, but they're really fast, right? Okay, good. So six, seven. 27, 28, 29, 32, 35, 36, 37, 38, 43, 46, 52, 58, 59, and 60, 64, 69, 70, 74, 76, 79, 82. Just remember, we did 14 examples in 50 minutes, plus some extra stuff. You'll be okay. Okay.